Hi, and welcome everyone to the Center for Jewish History's Family History Today series of genealogy themed public programs. A special welcome to everyone joining us from Europe and Israel, as the timing has finally allowed you to join us at a reasonable hour. Uh, my name is Moria Amit, and I am the Center's Senior Genealogy Librarian. For those of you who are not familiar with the Center, the Center uh, for Jewish History provides a collaborative home for five partner organizations that together form the largest archive on the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. In addition, the Center houses the Ackman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute, which is where I am based, and part of which you can see behind me. Um, at the Institute, we strive to connect researchers to the wealth of genealogy resources at the Center and to make family history accessible to researchers of all ages, abilities, and levels of experience, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. Our gene genealogy librarians, myself included, are still offering free one-on-one -on -one Zoom consultations, which can be a great way to get started in your research or to help you get past a brick wall. To schedule your Zoom consultation, please email us at gi at cjh.org. If you prefer to come in person, the Genealogy Institute is open by appointment uh, from Tuesday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. At the Institute, you will enjoy access to genealogy databases and reference books with our librarians on hand to provide guidance. To create an account and book your in-person appointment, go to libraryservices.cjh.org. In addition, you may continue to engage with us online by tuning into our genealogy coffee break webinars which air live on the center's facebook page on the second friday of every month at 2 p.m by attending future programs in our family history today monthly series and by emailing us at gi at cjh.org to ask for advice on your research questions a few technical notes before we get started Please send us your questions and comments anytime during the Q, uh, during this program by using the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Please note, however, that our guest speaker will be answering your questions during the dedicated Q&A period at the end of this program. If you'd like, uh, sorry, um, this program features live captions, which has been made possible through the support of the Institute for Museum and Library Services. If you'd like to view the captions for this program, click on the closed caption or CC button on the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitles. Finally, this program is being recorded. In one to two weeks, you will be able to watch the recording on the center's YouTube channel. So please stay tuned for that. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce today's speaker. Serafima Velkovich is the head of the Family Roots Research Section in the Reference and Information Department of the Yad Vashem Archives. Ms. Velkovich has been working at Yad Vashem for over 16 years now and was closely involved in indexing and digitizing Holocaust sources from Eastern Europe for Yad Vashem's central database of Shoah victims' names. If that was not enough, she was also the, a PhD candidate in sociology and history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I'm pleased to welcome back Serafima to our Family History Today series for an exploration of another crucial Holocaust research institution, the Arasun Archives. So thank you, Serafima, and please feel free to take it away from here. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you for having me today. Uh, I just need to share my screen, just a second. Um, I can do it. I'm sorry. Do you see the green? No, no, I know. I just, uh, when, okay. when I checked it, I just closed it. I'm really sorry. Uh, give me just a second, I'm doing it. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, I'm sorry for this technical, a small technical problem. I'm starting. So uh, today I want to present you a very important source for genealogy research, uh, which is called Ars and Archives. Uh, we'll speak about history, exploring and online access to this database. Um, Ars and Archives are branded in 2018. Uh, in, previously, it was called International Center. Um, it was called International Tracing Service, and it was International Center on Nazi Persecution. Um, it was uh, established um, as center, Central Tracing Bureau at the end of World War II by the Red Cross and Allies forces to test missing and displaced people and uh, to attempt uh, to reunite them with their relatives. Uh, personal documents were important component of the searching. Uh, uh, um, and was, was, what was important, the do, uh, document that Germans had produced for the um, purpose of the persecution, but at the same time also a document uh, that Elias used to register and care for liberated person, which were also um, in these databases. Since 1946, the central office has been located in Bad Arelsen, small town in, in the north of uh, in, in the northern Hesse, Germany. And you can see here in the picture the administrative building of, of the archives in Bad Arisen. Um, It was chosen uh, as ideal location for that time. Uh, the town Bad Arisen is a suitable uh, seat for the Central Tracing Bureau since it, it was located on the boundary of a three different occupation zone uh, after the war in American, British, and Soviet. And it had been, has not been destroyed. And at the same time, it had a good telegraph and telephone connection. In different years, um, different organizations uh, were responsible for the tracing bureau. In the beginning, it was Supreme Headquarters Allied Ex Expeditionary Force. Uh, after that, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. Um, after that, um, it, it was taken by International Refugee Organization, and uh, starting from 1951 till 1955, it was under the control of Allied High Commission uh, for Germany. The Allies um, determined that uh, the ITS would be financed by the German federal budget, uh, and the International Committee of the Red Cross would be responsible for its administration. The International Committee of the Red Cross um, would prove to be in invaluable for the ITS for its administrative capab capabilities and long history with the tracing service. An international commission at uh, that time of 10 countries, and nowadays there are 11 countries, in this commission would be responsible for the overall uh, supervision of the ITS uh, meeting annually uh, for this purpose. Um, the responsibility of the Allied High Commission for Germany for the tracing services ended in 1955, as I mentioned, and the Israeli government at that time was worried for the organizational management that would uh, be transferred to Germany, German government, and entrusted its delegation to support a proposal for the International Red Cross to manage the ITS. I want to show you several um, documents from Israel state archives. Uh, about uh, this is correspondence about um, this issue. It was very um, the issue had a very high priority, and this is, for example, uh, a letter uh, written uh, by the member of Israel Parliament Knesset Tzizling uh, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on November uh, 1953, and he wrote, "I brought an official query to the Knesset about the danger." of moving the documents organization to the Bonn government. Uh, this is another document from the Israel State Archives. Um, the letter written to Israel Embassy in Washington in uh, June 1954. And um, uh, it's also regarding the concern of moving the management to the German government. It, and it was written then quoting, there is a general agreement that removal of the ITS to any other location that artisan would mean the total interruption 
of its effectiveness for much prolonged period of time that it would uh, render it useless for all these who are interested in its functioning. Actually, uh, the concern was the, um, about uh, German government because Israelis were afraid uh, that the materials wouldn't be accept, uh, acceptable if the management will um, enter the, under the jo uh, German management. So um, this is one more additional document a meeting on filming uh, the archives of the tracing services uh, held in the Israel Foreign Ministry in 1954. The meeting, uh, um, in the meeting, the participants were from uh, Israel Foreign Ministry and also from World Jewish Congress. So following uh, the Bonn treaties in 1955, the International Commission was responsible for the establishment of the framework for the work of the institution and the ITS was supervised an international commission composed of representatives of nine Western countries, including Israel. The Israel representative was Yad Vashem, and we continue to be uh, the representative on Israel in this commission. Uh, Yad Vashem and ITS reached an agreement that allowed Yad Vashem to copy most of ITS collections. The copy was on microfilms, and it has since been acceptable in Yad Vashem. By 1960, copies of 5,467 microfilms of ITS documents were available in Yad Vashem archives. And I want to stress that since 1956, the documents were available. It's not in the same way as now we can access them, but since we could use it, it's very important fact. Um, since 1953, ITS began replying to inquiries uh, concerning historical research, but the number of inquiries answered was quite small. Um, and uh, archives uh, was closed for public uh, from the beginning of 80s, from the end of 70s, beginning of 80s, till 2007. That time in 70s and 80s, Yad Vashem um, which uh, the main mandate of Yad Vashem is commemoration. So Yad Vashem uh, did not take responsibility for relative searching. So I'm showing you here the documents from Yad Vashem uh, administrative archive, where you can see the letter uh, signed by secretary of the archives in 1979. And it's written here, we cannot help you in your search after your brother. We are not a relative search institute. We advise you to contact International Tracing Service in Arlson, Germany, which is the most competent authority for individual documentation. So I just wanted to mention that actually um, Arlson still was the most important uh, institution to search the documentation about relatives. Uh, under the international pressure in 2007, ITS opened its doors to researchers, survivors, and their family members. The German treaties of 2011 replaced the Bonn treaties of, 2000, uh, sorry, of 1955 and provided a renewed legal basis for the ITS. Among other things, it liberalized um, the finding of the archives by the German federal government and uh, specifically by the federal government Commissioner for Culture and Media. Tracing Sir at that time be, uh, has become archive. And it is very important uh, issue and I want to mention what does it mean. Uh, the very important uh, topic is archival principle. Uh, the main archival principle is principle of origin. That means that according to this principle, archival materials should be preserved in the order which it was originally. Thus, um, the context of the materials is preserved. The ITS, um, uh, they saw themselves as a tracing office and not archives. So they mix the various sources according to the names of people. They put materials from different collections to the envelopes according to the names, which is uh, allowed uh, easy searching for, easy tracing for the uh, specific persons. 
And I want to show you uh, the example from Buchenwald uh, concentration camp. Uh, for decades, uh, ITS staff used the documentation to search for people, and the archives was less known for academic research. So the, as a result, various collections were mixed together in order to fac facilitate this searching. And you can see here a records from different collections uh, concerning uh, Buchenwald camp, which were mixed all together. And now that it's, it's almost impossible to put back the collection to understand um, the historical context, the, to understand uh, maybe some uh, historical and social processes. So uh, in 2019, uh, the ITS, International Tertiary Service, were rebranded to Arzen Archives. Um, what uh, may be found in Arzen Archives? The International Tracing Service has an extremely large repository for World War II records, including Holocaust records. The collection holds information on approximately 17.5 million uh, people, as was registered by UNESCO Memory of the World. It includes documents on the various victims groups targeted by the Nazi regime uh, and uh, is an important source of knowledge for the society today, with its uh, 30 million original documents and 50 million index cards. I, I will, wanted also to mention that archives continue um, their work on receiving different materials and copies of the materials from different regional archives, specifically in Germany and other countries. So uh, the collection is all the time enlarged. Uh, I want to mention uh, the Jewish record. Jewish documents are only a part of the collection uh, and not all the Holocaust victims were recorded. That means uh, when we, uh, we can locate only names of victims who somehow were recorded in camps, in ghettos, on deportation lists, for example. Um, I, I want to uh, bring an example as uh, such as Dachau or Buchenwald concentration camp because their collection are ex especially extensive. Uh, but if the person uh, uh, was killed immediately after arriving to the camp, as it was with majority of uh, Jewish victims in Auschwitz Birkenau concentration camp, we cannot find any records at all. It is also important to know that uh, the ITS collection are almost no documents about the fate of Jews uh, from the territory of Soviet Union, um, where majority of Jews were killed um, in their hometowns or nearby. Moreover, the Soviet government did not cooperate with ITS after the war concerning uh, tracing the people. The collection of the documents from displaced persons camp is quite large. Uh, the files of displaced persons created shortly after the end of the war are well indexed is easily searched. We are speaking about displaced persons camps in Germany, Austria, and Italy. Uh, the same is true on application for assistance um, to the International Refugee Organization filled out by displaced persons. It is always quite touching uh, to find documents on, of babies who were born in displaced persons camp during the baby boom um, which, which was that year's post war where years in the pickens. We also can find their immigration records. In addition, the archives hold a huge collection of tracing documents and applications for search, which continue till this day. In 2015, the ITS started the process of uploading and presenting part of its doc documents online. And in 2019, together with rebranding and to open a big part of, of its database uh, for wide online searching. In a massive joint project with Yad Vashem, the Arzen archives uh, are using the technology and knowledge tool. Uh, the searching is similar to search in the Yad Vashem central database of Shoah victims' names because it is based on the same technology and the same uh, databases of variants of names and geographical locations. 
uh, the archives had, had been recognized as part of UNESCO collection uh, and important archives in, of victims of Nazi persecution. The Arizon archives continuously published more and more parts of its collection online in cooperation with Yad Vashem. And today, millions of pages of documents are already online. People ask, where can we find the full database of Arizon archives? Although the online collection is acceptable. Uh, Seema, um, yeah? it looks like your slides are not moving. No, no, forward. no, I'm here. That's OK. Don't worry. OK. No, 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 I don't. I, I, I didn't move yet. Oh, OK. Sorry. This is my theoretical part. And after that, I want to show practically how to search. So I just wanted to mention that um, a, many documents are now online. But uh, mm, not all the documents can be searched uh, online. Uh, they may be accept, uh, accessed uh, in, in the site of the institutions which are representative of the countries who participate in the commission, international commission. Uh, so um, what, what are these institutions? I want to mention where it can be searched. Uh, of course, in Israel, it's Yad Vashem. In the United States, it's uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. In the United Kingdom, it's the Wiener Library in London. It's, uh, there is access also in Poland Institute of National Memory, in State Archives of France, the State Archives of Belgium, and several more countries. So uh, now I, I'm moving further, and I want to show uh, the website and to show how to search. So this is uh, Arizon Archives website. Um, you need to enter search and explore to press search online archives. And you are entering uh, the field where it's online archive. You need to press the button that you agree with conditions of usage. So uh, this, now if you're entering the archival tree, this is mostly for general knowledge. You don't uh, use it for searching, but I want to show this is hierarchy, how it's built. Uh, the same hierarchy you can see in on-site database, which we have in our reading room. Um, the majority of the documents which are online from the uh, incarceration collection, which is uh, point one, and also uh, uh, from the collection of post-war documents um, of DP, uh, DP, displaced persons camps and immigration lists and all kinds of survivors, which is point three in this era. Uh, the tracing documentation are uh, here in the, in the point six, but uh, because of the all kinds of issues of privacy, this documentation, majority of this documentation is not available online. Uh, now, when you go to search, you have only one uh, line for searching. It's really a search like in Google, very simple. And I want to show now examples of the documents which can be accessible uh, online for your search. So here, I, for example, search a name, uh, Hilda Goldman. Uh, you always search from the last uh, side, and when you enter, uh, when you click the name, you see on the right side the scanned document. And this is uh, the document that's called uh, uh, application for assistance. As I mentioned, people who were in DP camps filled out this application and the collection is called the Care and Maintenance Program. Uh, this is the only collection where all the family members uh, recorded together. Actually, majority of the documents in Origin Archives are personal. So, in, but in this collection from uh, applications, we can find all the family members who were together in DP camps at, uh, at the same time. And they mentioned the um, war time period where they were. And also, uh, there are many personal details in these documents, um, knowledge on languages. Uh, occupation, all kinds of dates, um, knowledge uh, of some maybe tools. So you can see also photos there. It's very interesting document uh, and uh, the collection is very intensively now used by researchers also, not only uh, by the family members. 
Now, uh, I want to show several uh, different examples from the displaced person camp. The, there are several types of uh, DP cards, and this is one of the cards from Central Committee of Liberated Jews in the American Occupied, occupied Zone. Uh, another card looks like this. Um, you have your personal details, and this card, for example, of the baby who was born in 1946 in DP camp Poking, and we see here also the names of the parents. Um, which was recorded, the date of records, and uh, always interesting to look at the desired destination in these cards. In majority of cases, it's uh, written Palestine because Zionist ideology was very strong in displaced persons camps. Uh, majority of people wanted to immigrate to Israel, but um, actually we know that uh, people immigrated where they could receive visa that time. We're speaking about 46. So many cases when people come to search and they find information about their relatives or parents, uh, it's not the same where they arrived. I mean, they wanted to Palestine, but they could arrive to another country too. Uh, and this is the third type of uh, DP cards. It's a really identity card with a photo and fingerprints. And, um, it's also physical uh, characteristics or records of, of this person. I think it's amazing documents for family members to find. I only want to mention that uh, not about all the people who were in the camps we can trace such documents. It's, it depends where people a uh, person were specifically. And um, uh, I think it's really fortunate when we can find such documents. Now, um, I mentioned tracing documentation and I told that the majority of files are not online. Together with that, um, the early tracing documentation from, from the end of 40s um, are online. And uh, this is really tracing uh, by the relatives. Uh, later documentation usually is not tracing of relatives, but the application by the survivors in order to find some evidences about the route during the war, because um, they did it before uh, applying for the compensation from Germany. And these all tracing documents are interesting from the point of view of genealogy, because we can find here uh, the names and addresses of relatives, for example, for example, from the United States, who applied to this, like, all kinds of Jewish organization, like JOIN, for example, or a Jewish agency to search for their relatives in the DP camp. So these documents are online. Uh, this is, I brought only for example, uh, the tracing card, which is the first page of tracing, uh, the whole folder tracing file, but these documents are not online. I only want to uh, explain uh, and to show how to interpret, to interpret this document. So we always have a number, you can see it in, in red. Um, we have family name and first name in some, some cases, um, there are different spellings of the same name or different name of the same person because people change name after immigration. These uh, cards usually are um, issued in 50s or 60s. We also have names of the parents, uh, date of birth, which many uh, survivors also changed. You can see here two dates of birth, place of birth, um, we see here that it's written, this is religion, Jewish, um, also citizenship, Polish and stateless. This person uh, was a Polish Jew before the war and after the war he was stateless. Now, after that, we see the record of the dates and places where the person war was during the war. Uh, all these documents are in German because actually this is administrative correspondence of uh, international tracing service. So sometimes it's rather difficult for understanding, but uh, we just need to know some abbreviation. Z-A-L is, is um, forced labor camp, K-Z is concentration camp, and, and so on. DP is displaced persons camp. Um, I'm continuing showing what, what we have online in database. So this is least uh, completed after the war in, 
in the end of 40s by the places where people were after the war. And majority of these lists are from um, Germany. As I mentioned, the database is not Jewish, but so we, we need to pay attention if the people who are researching, if it's this region who their um, ethnicity also, or we can sometimes trace by different uh, clues if, if the right person was searching for. Um, now, there are also lists of immigration to Israel and to the United States, uh, usually by uh, sheep. Um, and uh, this is how this list look like. Um, so we can search also by the name of the sheep of the know, maybe by the date, but all, all the names uh, from that such list are indexed. So it's available by searching the name. Um, so as I mentioned many, there are many documents from the concentration camps. Unfortunately, not from all the camps, the uh, information exists. I mean, not in ours in general. Uh, and there are some camps that there are very rich information, but camps like Auschwitz, the information is very poor, unfortunately. Uh, this is an example of the documents from Stutthof camp. And what you see here on the picture is not a, a historical document. This is archival envelope. As I mentioned, they took in the past, they took different documents from, uh, about the same victim and put all together to the envelope in order to, to make it easier to, for searching. So this is archival envelope. And uh, on it, we can see personal details of the, of the searched uh, victim. Uh, what is important for us as researchers when we see uh, on the right uh, corner TD number, that means the tracing documentation file exists, and this is a number. If you apply uh, with this number to Yad Vashem or to Arizona Archives or to, to uh, USHMM, you can receive the tracing file, which is not online. It's very easy to locate with this number. Uh, and this is a card of prisoner, uh, which, which is found inside this envelope. Now, as I mentioned, uh, majority of the documents are not uh, of Jewish victims uh, of the Holocaust, but of the victims of Nazi persecution. And I, I wanted to show one example of such document. This is enveloped with the nine uh, documents um, from Buchenwald, from the person who, whose name is Igor Levkin. He was a Russian soldier. So this is uh, the document that we see, the scans. And when we click on the document, we can see this is, for example, prisoner cards. And we see here that this person was from the USSR. He was Orthodox. And so we understand he is Orthodox Christian Orthodox. He is not Jewish. We also can identify by the name uh, if the person is Jewish or not. Now I continue showing different examples. Uh, there are also online lists of deportation from Germany. So this is an example of such deportation from Frankfurt online to Yetolodge in 1941. And we see he, here the scan. Uh, once more, it, uh, the lists are indexed and we are sorting it by, by the name, which is very easy. This is another example of the deportation list, uh, the deportation from Berlin to Riga. And this is um, kind of a list which are from Berlin, a little bit in other um, form. Um, now, actually, the, as I mentioned, the, all the uh, records from the camps available online. Um, if we search uh, in, inside database, we also have central name index. We have a uh, huge index cards. So sometimes there are some lists which are available online, but it's very difficult to search with a specific person without a uh, reference which we, so we can find in this index card. So we usually um, advise people not to search lists online because it's, it's really sometimes impossible. But I wanted to show anyway that, that this is at least in, uh, I took an example of Mauthausen camp in Austria in 1938 because it's very early and there are no many documents from that time, but the camp existed already. 
So we enter, we're receiving um, different collections uh, from the same uh, camp and uh, concerning the same day that I searched, we can enter the collection and just uh, go through the list and see such lists, but it's really very difficult. It's better to apply it and will have help to search. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the Buchenwald collection is extremely extensive. Uh, if we, for example, found in a uh, personal envelope, a Buchenwald card with the um, number of prisoner, we can go to the Buchenwald collection to enter the list material Buchenwald and to search in the books of prisoners, which are by number. So if you know a specific number of, of the prisoner, we can find the specific page uh, looking through the pages with the numbers of the prisoners. Um, one more very important and interesting collection is uh, from the Netherlands. This is index cards from the Judenrat Jewish Council, um, with the, the original documents are um, uh, kept in uh, the Red Cross of, of Holland, the Netherlands, and uh, Arizona has uh, its copies. Uh, so we can see here many personal details and also details of the relatives and the dress where people lived, what's written in red, it's transport and, and the date. So by this date, actually in Yad Vashem database, we can uh, trace what were the transport, where it arrived, what happened to these people. In majority of cases, they arrived to um, concentration camps and died there, were killed there, and so the war and Auschwitz. So, but we can, uh, we can find exact information about the transport. Uh, and this is also important uh, card file from uh, Berlin, uh, completed by uh, Joint Distribution Committee, AJDC, uh, completed just after the war on the base of deportation uh, information. Uh, the original collection in Yad Vashem, but it's available online in Arzen. Uh, and we also can find here many personal details uh, uh, about person itself, himself, about uh, relatives, and also the address in Berlin. Uh, now, as you can uh, pay attention, uh, there are many uh, details in the documents, all kinds of abbreviations and numbers which are not clear, for, especially for person who are for the first time using it. So Arizon Archives has a very important tool, which is called eGuide. You can enter uh, on their website. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, you find there the pictures of the documents and examples of specific forms. And when you press to some uh, uh, field on the document, you can read what does it mean in general. For example, as I mentioned, there are envelopes of archives and this is an explanation what are these envelopes where from where it comes how they use it but when you press for example um to the uh, td number you can receive the explanation what does it mean and the same is relevant uh about different documents from concentration camps and different forms and also dp cards so the explanation is really good it's in, in german and in english uh website also has online library um because of the uh, copyright issues the uh books are very old from the post-war period from displaced person camps i think it's very important for a general knowledge historical context researchers who can read uh for example there is a guide in different languages for alias forces uh how to record displaced persons uh in different camps and it's very interesting uh, for historical knowledge. Uh, now, if you want to apply to Yad Vashem uh, as an official copy holder uh, to receive some documents or ask questions, you're welcome to apply to REF uh, at yadvashem.org.il. You also can apply via our website to reference and information service. It will arrive to our section, which is um, uh, we're ahead of the section of family roots research. And uh, this is all about my presentation and I'll be happy to answer the questions. Okay, 
Um, one second. Okay, sorry, let me just adjust my yeah, screen okay. here. So there are a number of questions from the audience. Okay. Um, Let's discuss it. <laughs> yes. So first of all, and, and uh, uh, anyone who uh, has a question that comes to them while we're doing the Q&A, feel free to add your question to the list and we will try to get through as many as possible um, before the end of this program. Okay, so uh, first of all, do you know if the Arson Archives has any plans to make um, all the records available online at some point for for the pub oh and uh, accessible yeah. to the public yeah as i know uh they really wish to upload as much as possible this is their goal mm -hmm. make it available but there are some documents which is uh according to privacy law for example or ethical issues uh cannot be uploaded online i can give an example of medical records on the best person hands from hospital for example Mm -hmm. uh, all kind of um, psych psychiatric um, expertise, or it's also concerning uh, tracing documentation. It's uh, continuous till today. When we enter TD files, we can see, for example, application from 2015 with the email of the applicant. So yeah. it cannot be available online such documents. Yeah, that's understandable. Do you have an idea of what the sort of cutoff is in terms of? how recent the information can be that they're making available online? Uh, what does it mean? What is the latest information? What, what, what is online? the most recent information that's online? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, um, all the original materials, all, uh, the majority of the materials are connect, uh, con connected to the wartime. Mm -hmm. If we're speaking about uh, camps, for example. Uh, the collection, uh, the aftermath collection is uh, till the beginning of 50s. Mm -hmm. Actually, the last displaced persons camps were closed in 50s already. So the latest documents are TD files. Is, so this is the same answer. I, I really think it's, it cannot be available the nearest time. I, I know they have planned maybe to upload um, part of uh, metadata, mm -hmm. that means indexed names but mm -hmm. not the scans. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, this is an interesting question. Uh, can you speak more about why why uh, survivors may have changed their birthdays in different documents? Oh. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting question. First of all, um, each person had its own reasons. <laughs> Let's say this way. <laughs> But if we are speaking, for example, for, about the survivors from the concentration camps, and I can give an example of Hungarian survivors. Hung, um, Hungarian Jews were sent to Auschwitz in the uh, spring and summer 1944. Those who were young, uh, who were under 14 years old, made themselves older in order to be sent um, to the working camp those who were younger were sent straightly to the gas chambers. Mm -hmm. So as an example, a majority of those who survived uh, from Hungary, were, they were young and they all, majority of them changed their day to birth during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, after the war, they were, each person had really different reasons. I, I know, I saw reason that somebody was 18, but he wanted to be in the um, DP village for orphanage for children mm -hmm. and he made them himself uh, younger mm -hmm. i just really yesterday talked to one uh, survivor and he told me that uh in each document he's recorded as being born in 1970 uh, uh, sorry uh, 37 but his real uh, year of birth is 36 and i asked why he told we were sent to cyprus but when, when they arrived to israel illegally Palestine illegally, they were sent by British authorities to Cyprus. And there were rumors that he, smaller children will be freer and sent back. So his mother wrote him the age, the year uh, less. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, in each um, situation, there the are different reasons, but it's it's really common spree phenomenon of changing dates of birth. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. 
So, okay. Um, so we see that the search results are displayed per person. Um, so once you've found the person that you're looking for, can you be confident that um, that you are seeing on the list of results everything on that individual or um, no, no, online, yeah. no. Yeah, no. okay. As I mentioned, uh, DP cards online, but for example, there are different DP lists. If I uh, remember correctly, they're working on that. They want to upload uh, all kinds of DP lists, but it's still not indexed finally. Mm -hmm. uh, they have very interesting uh, project uh, for public uh, where each person can volunteer actually to apply them to index documents online. Oh, okay. Now sourcing project, and each of us can just help them to index it. And it's still that's still going on now, right? Yeah, correctly. Okay. So for those of you out there who are interested in helping uh, current and future researchers to find their Great. family, uh, the fast it will be done. The, yep. The the faster will receive the results online. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um. Okay. Let's see. Uh, another person asked about searching by name and place. Is that possible to do in the online it, archive? Uh, it's possible, but not all the documents are indexed by the, including the place in the index. Okay. So it, it can be that you are receiving not all the results. That's good to At know. At the same time, if it's big place and if it's common street family name, you can receive too many results. So I think it's better in this database to search by the family name and the first name. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, would uh, the Arson Archives be the best source for DPs who returned to the USSR um, after the war? I think yes, but it also depends on which DP camp the person was. I can mention also that uh, EVO archives, which is <laughs> on your site, yes. has a huge collection of DP documents, which are not online, unfortunately, yet. Yes. Some, <laughs> once it will be online, but it's also they have also big yeah. collection. We there are do, also yeah. documents on DP camps in joint uh, DDC archives. Mm -hmm. In Yad Vashem, we also have big collections of DP uh, materials, but it's usually it's not personal cards, it's just more general uh, materials, but still mm -hmm. it can be searched. Yeah, that's a good point. So there's lots of DP uh, camp materials spread in across multiple archives uh Correct. internationally um yeah but of course arison is the first source to search online at home comfortably yeah <laughs> um okay so there are questions about specific um countries and whether arson has arca has records on um i guess polish um Polish concentration camps. Okay, let's let me tell a little bit about that. <laughs> it's rather complicated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, majority of Polish Jews um, were sent to such camps where there were no records. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Treblinka or Sobibor or Maidan, because there are no records of this. Um, the the majority of records that we have about Polish Jews in Arizona are post-war documents about survivors. That means DP cards and application for assistance and TD file, tracing documentation. Mm -hmm. In general, um, there are not many documents exist about Polish Jews. For example, I, when I'm speaking about Yad Vashem database, I only want to mention it. Um, in Western, in um, Central Europe, Jews were not killed at the places of their living. They were sent to the East, and during this process of deportation, they were recorded. Because of that, we have a majority of the names from these countries. The East we are going, and starting from the Poland, for example, 
the last possibilities was for searching because Jews were killed in the country where they lived or the places where they lived. And some nobody recorded it. Yeah. So uh, because of that, it's rather complicated to search. And in Arison, it's different to find something about those who were killed. And as I mentioned, for example, um, when uh, Jewish victims arrived to Arison, uh, sorry, Arison, to Auschwitz, Birkenau, uh, those who were uh, sent to the gas chambers immediately were not recorded. They didn't went through selection, they didn't receive a number, they were killed without any record. So mm -hmm. there are no any documents about that. Right. Um, uh, another uh, person asks about uh, Bulgarian records. No, it's not in Arizona. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's in Bulgarian archives. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Ah, this is a good one. Is there any place that I can access applications uh, to the German government for restitution? Yes. Um, when you uh, apply us, for example, and receive um, TD files, recent documentation, usually on TD files it's written to which office they applied. And if you ask us, we can recommend where to apply in Germany. Okay. But it's not online. You need to apply to send a letter. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, I see this email address somebody <laughs> wants. Email address of what? Of Arizona? It's just uh, online, Arizona Archives. Mm -hmm. uh, very easy to find. If you are, want to apply us in Israel, it's REF at Yad Vashem, Reference Information Service. Okay. Um, thank you. Somebody also asked for the websites again. I can put that in the chat yeah. shortly. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. How can one find records from orphanages? And it looks like she's specifically looking for um an orphanage in germany in the 30s 30s no, yeah it's not the source uh as i mentioned it was established uh in the second uh, part of 40s and it's um only cover the wartime period mm -hmm. and aftermath but yeah. if you are speaking about orphanage um after the war and dp camps and they, are, they have lists of uh, children, of course, from GP camps, and they also have a child search branch where there were uh, unaccompanied children who were um, held by social workers to fill out the forms to search for their parents, for their relatives. Um, for example, Yad Vashem has, it's not an Arison, but it's continuing the, the topic of GP camps, Yad Vashem has questionnaires of um, children who were in DP camp turned invite, completed by social workers. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Is there a list of labor camps um, that, uh, that the Arson Archives maintains? Uh, and sorry, lists of prisoners in labor camps that the Arson Archives maintains. Once more, it depends mm -hmm. about which camp we're speaking. Yeah, of course. But labor camp can be a kind of factory, which is sub camp of the Buchenwald. Camp. Right. Or it can be labor camp in um, uh, Romania, for example, or, or Hungary, where, where there are no records. It's very much depends on the geographical place. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Ah, um, okay. Okay. Um, is there any information about Jews that escaped into the USSR and then were in slave labor camps? 
there. Okay. <laughs> this is huge topic and I can speak, <laughs> I can give the whole lecture about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> for you to know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, we're speaking about Polish Jews who were deported or who were refugees in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. There are some lists, rather small lists, of, uh, completed by World Jewish Congress, uh, which we can find on, uh, in our Zen archives, lists of Polish um, Jews who are now in USSR. Now that means 44, 45, before they came back to Poland. So there is such an information, but it's not rich. I mean, there are no such, there are no many such lists, mm -hmm. but there, there were uh, about 230,000 Jews uh, from Poland in the Soviet Union during the war. So, but after that, when they, they repatriated to Poland and did not stay there and continue to DP camps, we can find information about them in DP cards, in uh, application for assistance once more, and there they recorded where they were in Soviet Union usually. So that means um, in many cases, we cannot find uh, the documents from the Soviet period, but we can find the information about the same people uh, after the uh, uh, aftermath, uh, the period of the end of 40s, before mm -hmm. their immigration. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's see. Number of questions again about the people changing their ages, but I feel like you've addressed that very well. Um, oh, okay. Maybe just does, also, does the, uh, several words. First of all, people not only change their dates, they also change the names. <laughs> uh, and we can see in the tracing documentation, for example, uh, as I mentioned, these documents were uh, completed in the 50s and 60s from the places where they immigrated already. So majority of Jews who immigrated to Israel uh, changed their names to something more uh, uh, in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. As just an example, uh, maybe somebody was Herman or Hersh, he became T in Israel, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, in America, there's similar processes. Absolutely. They, they, people are, 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 sorry, Americanized <laughs> their name. So it's also very prominent in the document. So. We need to pay attention to that. And also one more um, topic, which is important, um, is the topic of spelling. As I know for Americans, it's very important. And uh, I wouldn't say it's really important because uh, kind of um, different clerks in different camps. If somebody was, for example, Germ from Germany uh, originally, he could write the name phonetically, but the spelling was in German. And if clerk was uh, from Poland, he wrote it in Polish way. So we need to just to think how it sounds. And the system is um, taken uh, from the Yad Vashem database and have variants. That means that all the names which are phonetically the same but with different spellings in different languages are coming all together by searching. So it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter how you spell it. Okay. Uh, the same for um i guess the same question can go for place names as well do you have an explanation yeah. why people may have listed different um birth places or places that they lived before the war let's say yeah uh it also depends on the historical situation um for example if uh, we are speaking about polish jews who were in soviet union <clears throat> um those who were immigrated to the united states uh, they could not mention that uh, they were in Soviet Union because it was um, a document um, declaration uh, uh, signed by the American government in, in the end of 40s, I think in 48, um, and mentioning that uh, Polish Jews be, who was in Soviet Union were undesired refugees for uh, American policy, and they uh -huh. didn't receive visas. Americans were afraid of communism being uh, being brought uh, by uh, Jews, which is rather funny nowadays because these Jews ran away from communists. <laughs> so yeah, there were different circumstances made them. Sometimes somebody mentioned a uh, bigger town or bigger city because he was from some small place and he wanted to mention from where he is. And he did not say uh, I was from a small village, but he spoke about bigger town next to this village, something like that. 
Um, okay, I'm not sure to what extent you address this during your presentation, but um, is it correct that there's a, a larger um, database of the Arlson archives that's only available at specific institutions like Yad Vashem and uh, the U.S. Holocaust Museum? That's 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 yeah. has more names than what's than what is on uh, you know online for everyone. No, of course, online less names that we have in databases, it is for sure. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, today ours and archives continue our public position. That means that they receive documents from different archives, and we have updates once a, a year, I think. So we receive new then new materials in our database. But of course, they received it previously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, theoretically, we have the same. Maybe uh, only the, the exception is, as I mentioned, all kinds of medical records, which are because of the ethical uh, issues and privacy are not available. They, they can send it all only to their relatives in general. Um, but it, uh, my question is, is there any advantage to uh going to Yad Vashem to search uh the Arson archives material versus just doing it from home of course okay uh, you can not to go you can apply okay. to Arizon to Yad Vashem to your Sitchimem but of course on site uh sitting in the office or you those who arrive to the reading room can can see the, the whole database of course okay it's more expensive, as I mentioned. For example, there are several millions of JSON documentation files, which mm -hmm. are not online. Okay, thank you. Um, so for those of you uh, who are American, it's, it would be similar to going to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Um, exactly, but once more, nowadays we don't need to go somewhere to, <laughs> to receive information. Right. You just need to, to email us and we'll, We'll, uh, we'll send the documents. We'll, okay. we'll make a research and we'll send the documents. Um, uh, someone asks about how long does it take to hear back from the archives? They sent a request okay. a year we ago and they have, have not received anything. We, yeah, <laughs> we have a rule that we, we have to answer during three weeks. Okay. Uh, we are really trying to answer fast. Sometimes, for example, in the spring where we have Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel, we overload it, so it takes yeah. longer. But uh, as I know, ours and nowadays answer rather fast. In the past, it, it could take even several years. Okay. <laughs> nowadays, it's much faster, but uh, exactly, I, I don't know, maybe a month or two, something like that. They have big okay. stuff uh, for tracing uh, the raw to answer. Okay. Um, perfect. So. I guess my uh, follow up to that would be that if you haven't received an answer from Orison Archives, then you could also try uh, requesting information from Yad Vashem. Oh, or... don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll t> <laughs> we have cases when people apply to different institutions after that. <laughs> oh, and then you're all re repeating the same work. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. We, okay. They're receiving the same documents. <laughs> Okay, so maybe scratch that. Ignore what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. <clears throat> ah, many Ukrainian Jews were deported by the Romanian military to what is now part of Moldova. Um, how good are records from, from of those individuals? In Arizona, nothing. As I mentioned, okay, uh, there are no records from Soviet Union in Arizona. Okay, uh, the, maybe the exception only the records from uh, concentration camps like Dachau mm -hmm. and Stutthof were Lithuanian Jews were sent. But okay, those who were sent to the Transnistria to the Mogilev Podolsk, which I, I think this is the yeah, issue here. It's it's not available in Arizona at all. Okay. Um, let's see.
Is there anything I've missed? Uh, oh, this is a good question. Um, can you address uh, why the ITS was closed to the public? for decades oh, i think it's uh, it's complicated uh, political issues and okay. it's, i know that it's really under the press international pressure and specifically by the participants of um, the director of the united states Holocaust memorial museum uh it was opened in 2007 for the first time mm -hmm. but, yeah okay a as i mentioned it was closed but it, uh, the documentation was available in the Yad Vashem. okay so, all these years all the all all of that time yeah of course not in this forum it was not searched by the name in the comfortable database it was only microfilms it was just you needed to sit with the old machine to to go through the pages mm -hmm. um let's see okay so i don't know if you want to go through the list and pick something out um, and while I, while you do that, I'm going to put in some of those uh, websites that people asked about and email addresses. So yeah, you could put it right to the chat or you want me to, to... No, I will go ahead and, and do that. You'll do it. Okay. If you want to find yeah. another question that you'd like to answer, that, that would be great. Uh, I don't know. Let, let me check. Um... Helmlodev's camp, I see here the question. There are no records from Helmlo at all. There are, uh, there are death camps and concentration camps. In concentration camps, um, the, there were people who went through selection, like Auschwitz. There are some people, uh, the small part, who went through selection and they were somehow recorded. But those who arrived to the death camp, they were not recorded. And not Treblinka, as I mentioned already, there are no records. Sometimes, um, if, for example, uh, somebody was sent from Lodge, Uch to, to Helna, uh, there can be the list of transport from Ghetto Lodge, but in this ghetto, it was rather well recorded. So it depends from where they were sent. In the cases, if, if I, I'm, I'm sorry that <laughs> I'm still representative of Yad Vashem, and um, in the cases where we cannot find any records, we always ask people to fill out pages of testimony, which are a very big collection of Yad Vashem, in order to somehow commemorate the victim, uh, to find his name in the database of Holocaust victims. Because we, we consider such forms as, memor as virtual memorial of this victim. We don't have any other documents. Uh, someone also asked about the meanings of the abbreviations KL, KZ, and ZAL. Okay. Yeah, it's a KL, it's a um, concentration camp. Uh, KZ, KZ, I think, is the same. Uh, ZAL, it's a um, um, forced labor camp. Oh, okay. It's in German, in German. You can find it in the e guide, I think, all, all these um, explanations. Okay. Um, is there an exhaustive list of all of the collections in the Arlson archives? That's what I uh, saw you in the beginning, which okay. is uh, archival tree. Okay. These are the majority of this, the collections. Yeah. Okay. Bear with me while I find uh, the um, other websites for you website of arzen i did the i did the website of arlson already let's ah okay what you okay. wait mm -hmm. so now i'm ah, gonna wait put, yeah now i'm putting yeah. in yad vashem yad vashem and the email is ref at ref like reference ref at yad vashem dot org dot org dot il no, that's oh. I L. Oh, dot I L at the end. Sorry. Yeah, it's not correct. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, let me open the the, the page where I read, read. Just a moment here. Mm. 
Okay. Okay. I'll just search in the Google Reference Information Service of Yad Vashem. You'll find our page mm -hmm. on the Yad Vashem website. Yes. Um, and finally, somebody asked uh, how would they go about uh, volunteering for, um, uh, uh, I, I guess, Arlson Archives um, you indexing? You need to search for the information. Uh, they have on their uh, web page, I think even on their homepage. Okay. They really uh, would like to invite more people. They have very big. Uh, project uh, which is crowdsourcing really people from all over the world participate um, in, in indexing the documents. They yeah so if you go to uh, their website which I placed here arlsonarchives.org in the chat box you can uh, you should be able to find that information pretty quickly. Right. Um, okay I think uh, it's time to wrap up. Is there any last point you would like to make, uh, Serafima? Uh, I only maybe want to uh, to tell that uh, sometimes I see that people search it kind of fine and they're really disappointed. And uh, this is the in general genealogy issue that not from all the places we can find the materials. Unfortunately. Yeah, so, and not all and not all the names have survived as well unfortunately correct yeah so i think anyway uh don't give up mm -hmm. <laughs> continue searching and in with the modern technology we the archives continue uploading more and more materials online all the time so maybe one day we, you can find some yeah information which is exactly good to the family <laughs> okay um thank good you luck so with much searching to everybody yes and good luck with your searches and uh, I look forward to seeing you all next time uh, for the uh, next uh, Family History Today uh, program. So, um, and with thank that, you very much, Moria, for this opportunity to speak. Oh, yes. you're most welcome. I'm happy to have you anytime. Okay, you, have okay. a good night, everyone, or good day. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.